We now come to questions to the Prime Minister, and we start the questions with Ruth Cabri. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. According to Home Office figures, oh, sorry, question one. Sorry. Sir. Uh, Mr Speaker, I know the whole House will want to join me in sending our deepest sympathies to the family and friends of Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, who sadly passed away on Saturday. His leadership had a profound impact on our whole country and across the world. May his memory be a blessing. Mr Speaker, this morning I attended the service at Westminster Abbey to mark the centenary of the tomb of the unknown warrior. Armistice Day allows us to give thanks to all of those who have served and continue to serve, and those who have given their lives in service of this country. Ruth Capri. Thank you, Mr Speaker. According to Home Office figures, just 12% of Windrush victims have received compensation and nine people have died waiting. This is two and a half years after the Windrush Task Force was set up. What will the government do, both to, and what will the Prime Minister do, to both rectify this injustice, but also ensure that no others who have come to the UK to live and work do not suffer in the same way as the Windrush victims. Prime yeah. Minister. Uh, well, uh, the Honourable Lady is right to raise this issue, and it is uh, what happened to the Windrush uh, generation uh, was a, a disgrace and a scandal, and we're doing our best collectively uh, to, to make amends. And uh, I can tell that I've met uh, members of, uh, of that uh, generation, and this government is taking steps to accelerate uh, the payments and to make sure that those who are in line uh, with payments are given uh, every opportunity, all the information they need to in avail themselves of, of the compensation that they deserve. Fiona Bruce. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister in respect for our servicemen and women, past and present, in protecting our peace? With regard to our battle against COVID, senior church leaders have this past week issued a call for prayer across our nation. The Prime Minister, I know, is very well aware of the persecution suffered by countless people of faith across the world for wanting to pray and manifest their faith. Will he join me in supporting our church leaders' call for prayer and in championing the universal human right of freedom of religion or belief wherever one lives? Yes, uh, yes indeed, Mr Speaker. And I thank my honourable friend for the work that she does to champion that cause. And we all know that wherever freedom of belief is under attack, other human rights are under attack as well, and we will continue to work closely uh, with like-minded partners to stand up for members of, uh, of such marginalised communities. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, the Right Honourable Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join with the Prime Minister in his comments about Jonathan Sachs? Can I also send all of our thoughts to those affected by the terrible events in Saudi Arabia uh, this morning? Um, can I welcome the victory uh, of President-elect Biden and Vice-President-elect Harris? a new era of decency, integrity and compassion in the, in the White House. And can I also welcome the fantastic news about a possible breakthrough in the vaccine. It's early days, uh, but this will give hope to millions of people that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Mr Speaker, today is Armistice Day, and I'm sure the whole House will join me in praising the remarkable work of the veterans' charities, such as Help for Heroes and the Royal British Legion. Like many other charities, Help for Heroes has seen a significant drop in its funding during this pandemic, and they're now having to take very difficult decisions about redundancies and keeping open recovery centres for veterans. So can the Prime Minister commit today that the Government will do whatever it can to make sure our armed force charities have the support that they need so that they can carry on supporting our veterans? Prime Minister. Uh, yes, indeed, Mr Speaker, and I, I echo entirely what uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman says about Help for Heroes. It's a, a quite remarkable charity and does wonderful things for, for veterans. And it, these, uh, in these difficult times, uh, many charities are, of course, uh, finding it tough. Uh, and uh, I, in addition to uh, what the Government is, is doing to 
uh, support charities through uh, cutting VAT on their, on their, on their uh, cutting business rates on their premises and cutting uh, VAT uh, on their shops. Mr. Speaker, I would also urge everybody, wherever possible, to make online contributions uh, to charities that are currently struggling. I thank the Prime Minister for his reply. The truth is, the Chancellor's package for forces charities was just six million pounds during this pandemic, and that's just not sufficient. Can I ask the Prime Minister to reconsider that support on their behalf? Because at the same time, we've all seen this weekend that the government can find £670,000 for PR consultants. And Mr Speaker, that's the tip of the iceberg. New research today shows that the government has spent at least £130 million of taxpayers' money on PR companies, and that's this year alone. Does the Prime Minister think that that's a reasonable use of taxpayers' money? Uh, Mr Speaker, I think he's referring to the Vaccines Task Force, and after days in which the uh, Labour Party has attacked the Vaccines Task Force, I think it might be in order for him to pay tribute uh, to them uh, for securing uh, 40 million doses. And by the way, the, ca- the, the, the expenditure to which he refers uh, was to help raise aw- awareness of vaccines, to fight the anti-vaxxers, uh, Mr Speaker, and to persuade the people of this country, 300,000, to take part in trials without which we can't have vaccines, Mr Speaker. So I think you should take it back. Mr Speaker, nobody's attacking individuals. Everybody's supporting the vaccine. £130 million, Prime Minister. There's a real question about the way that contracts are being awarded, about basic transparency and accountability. And I know the Prime Minister doesn't like that. This is not the Prime Minister's money, Mr Speaker. It's taxpayers' money. The Prime Minister may well not know the value of the pound in his pocket, but the people who send us here do, and they expect us to spend it wisely. Let me illustrate an example of the Government's lax attitude to taxpayers' money. Earlier this year, the Government paid about £150 million to a company called Iandal Capital to deliver face masks. Can the Prime Minister tell the House how many usable face masks Actually provided, were actually provided to NHS workers on the front line under that contract? Uh, Mr Speaker, we're in the middle of a global pandemic uh, in, in which, this, uh, which this government uh, has so far secured and delivered 32 billion items of personal protective equipment. And yes, uh, it is absolutely correct, Mr Speaker, that it's been necessary to, uh, to work with the, with the private sector, with uh, manufacturers who provide equipment uh, such as this, some of them more effectively uh, than others, Mr Speaker. But it's the private sector that in the end makes the PPE. It's the private sector that, pro- that provides the testing equipment, Mr Speaker, and it's the private sector that, no matter how much the party opposite may hate them, it's the private sector that provides the vaccines and the scientific breakthroughs, Mr Speaker. Here's Starmer. The answer is none. Exactly. Not a single face mask at a cost of £150 million. Mr Speaker, that's not an isolated example. We already know that consultants are being paid £7,000 a day to work on test and trace, and a company called Randox has been given a contract without process for £347 million. That's the same company that had to recall 750,000 unused COVID tests earlier this summer on safety grounds. And there's a sharp contrast between the way the government sprays money at companies who don't deliver and their reluctance to provide long-term support to businesses and working people at the sharp end of this crisis. The, the Chancellor spent months saying that extending furlough was, these were his words, not the kind of certainty that British businesses or British workers need, only then to do a U-turn at the last minute. Yesterday's unemployment figures show the cost of that delay. Redundancies up by a record 181,000 in the last quarter. What's the Prime Minister's message to those that have lost their jobs because of the Chancellor's delay? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I, with great respect to the uh, right honourable gentleman, uh, he knows full well uh, that the 
furlough programme has continued throughout uh, this pandemic. Uh, it went right the way through to October. It's now going through uh, to March. It's one of the most generous programmes in the, in the world. Uh, 80% of income supported by uh, this government. A, an overall package of £210 billion, pounds, Mr Speaker, going in to support jobs, families uh, and livelihoods throughout this country. I think this country can be very proud of the way we've looked after the entire population uh, we, when we, and we are going to continue to do so. And he should bear in mind, Mr Speaker, that the net effect of those furlough programmes, all the uh, provision that we have made, is disproportionately beneficial for the poorest and neediest in society, which is what One Nation Conservatism is all about, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister must know that because the furlough wasn't extended until the last minute, Thousands of people were laid off. And the figures tell a different story. Redundancies, as I say, record high, 181,000, 780,000 off the payroll since March. ONS saying unemployment is rising sharply. So much for putting their arms around everybody. The trouble is that the British people are paying the price for the mistakes of the Prime Minister and the Chancellor. If they'd handed contracts to companies that could deliver, public money would have been saved. If they'd extended furlough sooner, jobs would have been saved. If they'd brought in a circuit breaker when the science said so, lives would have been saved. Let me deal with another mistake. The Chancellor has repeatedly failed to close gaps in support for the self-employed. Millions are affected by this. It's bad enough to have made that mistake in March. But seven months on, the Institute of Fiscal Studies says the scheme remains, their words, wasteful and badly targeted for the self-employed. The Institute of Directors. Many self-employed continue to be left out in the cold after seven months and so many warnings. Why are the Chancellor of the Prime Minister still failing our self-employed? Mr. Mr. Speaker, unquestionably this pandemic has been hard on the people of this country and unquestionably uh, there, are, there are people who have, have suffered throughout the pandemic and people whose, whose, uh, whose livelihoods have, have suffered. But we have done everything that we possibly can uh, to help. And as for the self-employed, Mr. Speaker, 2.6 million of them have received support uh, at a, 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 a bit, a cost of £13 billion. Pounds. Quite right, Mr. Speaker. We've also, of course, as he knows, uprated universal credit. That will continue uh, until next year, Mr Speaker. Uh, he now champions universal credit, by the way, uh, and calls for it, uh, to, its uprating to be extended. He stood on a manifesto, Mr Speaker, to abolish universal credit. Starmer. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister just doesn't get it. I know very well that the self-employment income support scheme has been extended, but the Prime Minister must know that that scheme simply doesn't apply to millions of self-employed people. They've been left out for seven months. And there's a real human cost to this. This week on LBC, I spoke to a self-employed photographer called Chris. He said to me, our industry has been devastated. There's three million of us that have fallen through the cracks. Our businesses are falling, absolutely falling and crashing each day. He asked me to raise that with the Chancellor. I'll do the next best thing. What would the Prime Minister say to Chris and millions like him who are desperately waiting for the Chancellor to address this injustice? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, what I would say to Chris and what I say to the our right honourable gentleman and to, and, to the, and to the whole country is the best way to get his job working again, the best way to get this country back on its feet is to continue on the path that we are of driving the virus down. And I'm grateful, I'm grateful to the people. This is a week, Mr Speaker, since we entered into uh, the tough autumn measures that we're now in. I'm grateful to the people of this country for the sacrifices that they're making. And uh, I'm particularly grateful to the people of, of Liverpool. Uh, and, uh, and elsewhere who are now taking part, tens of thousands of people in Liverpool, taking part in the mass testing work that's going on there. And it's fantastic news that we now have the realistic prospect of a vaccine, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, but and science has given us uh, two big boxing gloves, as it were, uh, with which to pummel uh, this virus, but then neither of them uh, is capable of delivering a knockout blow on its own. And that's why uh, this country needs to continue to work hard, to keep discipline and to observe the measures that we've put in. And I'm grateful uh, to the party opposite, grateful for the support uh, that they're now giving uh, for those measures. Uh, that is uh, the way to do it, Mr Speaker. Hands, face, space, 
follow the guidance, protect the NHS and save lives. Let's head to Tewkesbury with Lawrence Robertson. Lawrence Robertson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, as we and all countries across the world tackle the pandemic, uh, is it not right that we also have to secure our post-EU future? And aren't we doing that uh, by securing help uh, for our rural communities and indeed securing our borders? Prime Minister. Absolutely. Well, I, th I thank my, uh, my, my honourable friend and I can tell him that uh, the landmark immigration bill receives royal assent uh, today. Uh, thanks to this House, paving the way uh, for uh, our fulfilling of our manifesto commitment to end free movement and have a new, fair, points-based immigration system. Mr Speaker, one of the advantage, advantages of leaving uh, the European Union, which the, the gentleman opposite would, would, of course, like to reverse. Let's head up to Scotland to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister on the uh, death of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs? And of course, this being Armistice Day, that we commemorate the day 102 years ago on the 11th hour of the 11th month when the guns fell silent, and all those that have paid the ultimate sacrifice in conflict since then. And of course, I would wish to send our best wishes to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in winning the election in North America and look forward to the leadership that they will show on issues of climate change and the issue of fighting back against. COVID, amongst other things. Mr Speaker, the Office of National Statistics figures published yesterday demonstrate what the SNP have been warning about for months, that the UK faces a growing Tory unemployment crisis. It is now beyond doubt that the Chancellor's last-minute furlough U-turn came far too late for thousands who have already lost their jobs as a result of Tory cuts and delays and the dither that took place. UK unemployment has now risen to 4.8%. Redundancies are at a record high, and nearly 800,000 fewer people are in employment. To support those who have lost their incomes, will the Prime Minister now commit to make the £20 uplift to universal credit permanent and extend it to legacy benefits so that no one, no one Prime Minister, is left behind? Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I'm delighted that the uh, right honourable gentleman of the Scottish Nationalists is now supporting uh, universal credit uh, because he was opposed to it at the last, uh, at, at the last election. Uh, yes, of course, that uplifting uh, continues, Mr Speaker, until, until March. And, and, I'm, deli and I, I'm delighted uh, to say that, uh, that the furlough scheme is being extended right the way through uh, to March as well, and that will support people across our whole United Kingdom, protecting jobs and livelihoods across the whole UK in exactly the way that he and I would both want. Yeah. Right, let's return to Ian Blackford. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. You know, can I respectfully say to the Prime Minister, the idea is that the Prime Minister tries to answer the question that's been put to him, and it is shameful that the Prime Minister still gives, refuses to give a commitment to the uprating of the £20 of universal credit. And the SNP will continue to demand a permanent U-turn on Tory plans to cut universal credit. Mr Speaker, another group who have been left behind by this Prime Minister are the three million people who have been completely excluded from UK government support. Since the start of this crisis, the Prime Minister has repeatedly refused to lift a finger to help these families. Can I say to him, in the run-up to Christmas, the forgotten millions will be amongst those who are struggling to get by and worried about their future. So can I ask the Prime Minister, will he finally fix the serious gaps in his support schemes to help the excluded, or will he make it a bitter winter for millions of families across the United Kingdom? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, the uh, right honourable gentleman knows, I, I hope, that we're not only continuing with the uprating of universal credit until, uh, until next year. We've, we've, uh, we've invested uh, 210 billion, as I say, in, in jobs and livelihoods. But we've also just brought forward a, a winter support package, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, for the poorest and neediest, supporting uh, people, uh, young people, kids who need uh, uh, school meals, uh, supporting people throughout our society, throughout the tough period of COVID, as I think the entire country would expect. That is the right thing to do, and we will continue to do it, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we continue to protect the NHS to help save lives, regional airports are playing a critical role delivering medical supplies and equipment across the UK. Yet, an extra airport in my constituency of East Devon, overall passenger numbers are at some 5% of normal. Regional airports are facing multi-billion pound business rates bills and are asking for a payment holiday similar to businesses in retail and hospitality, including supermarket giants. What assurances can my right honourable friend give East Devon's aircraft engineers, cabin crew and pilots that the government will look to temporarily scrap business rates so our regional airports can keep the country connected throughout this pandemic? Prime Minister. Well, I'm sure my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, will have heard his... Uh, his, his words. I thank him uh, for what he said. He's quite right to champion regional airports and uh, the aviation business. I can tell him that the, uh, the Bank of England's uh, COVID corporate financing facility uh, has, or is, is helping the, the support the airline's uh, current liquidity problems with the sector drawing down £1.8 billion in support. And where also the Department of Transport is looking at giving bespoke a support to particular uh, regional airports in order, Mr. Speaker, to keep them going in these tough times. Jonathan yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, West Wales and the Valley has received over €2 billion Euros in direct EU economic investment during the 2014 20 um, multi annual financial framework. This support will come to an end in a matter of weeks, yet the British Government have yet to publish its alternative proposals despite all the promises of not a penny less. When will he level with the people of Carmarthenshire and the rest of Wales? that the British Government are about to pick our pockets. Prime Minister. Well, um, Mr Speaker, uh, on the contrary, the, the UK Government is, is continuing to uh, support uh, all parts of the, of the UK. We'll now, as he knows, have the opportunity uh, to fund uh, projects with our own uh, money rather than siphoning it uh, through Brussels. And the quantum, uh, the quantum uh, Mr Speaker, will be uh, identical. And I, and I can tell him that, in addition, uh, in addition uh, the, the, through the Barnet formula, the UK Government has already given uh, the Welsh Government uh, £2.4 billion in capital funding alone this year. Mr Speaker, whilst we are rightly focused on battling COVID, we should not ignore humanitarian injustices and the plight of persecuted minorities. On Remembrance Sunday, 82-year-old Mahbub Ahmad Khan was shot dead, the fourth Ahmadi recently slain in Peshawar. His crime under Pakistani law? To call himself an Ahmadi Muslim, whose creed is love for all, hatred for none. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that hatred preached in Pakistan ends up on the streets of Britain. And it is in the interest of our own security that Her Majesty's Government should make clear to Pakistan that state-supported persecution must end. Well, I, I agree passionately with my honourable friend. And uh, I, can, I can tell him that that is why the Minister for South Asia uh, recently raised this very issue uh, with Pakistan's Human Rights Minister, and we urge the Government of Pakistan to guarantee the fundamental rights of all its citizens. Unfortunately, we have recently seen the largest increase in Welsh unemployment for nearly 30 years. Now, the Prime Minister will know that the hospitality and events sectors have been dealt a, a heavy blow by COVID-19, but we cannot forget about the businesses in their supply chains. Many have not been eligible for grant support, and although welcome, bounce-back loans and the furlough scheme do not offer them support to cover running costs through the winter months. Will the Prime Minister therefore raise this matter with the Chancellor and bring forward a package that offers businesses in the supply chain some hope of seeing the spring? Yes. Prime Minister. Uh, he, he raises an excellent point and one of the things that we're looking at uh, together with uh, local authorities and, and uh, Welsh tourist authorities is ways of making sure that we keep a, a tourist season going uh, throughout the tough winter months. Alexander. Thank you Mr Speaker. Christmas is a time for joy and the celebration of hope. In Rother Valley, we have a renowned Christmas scene. From the Christmas festival in Diddington, Christmas wreath making in Toddwick, the Maltby Lion Santa Sleigh ride, carols at All Saints Aston, and even my own new annual Christmas card competition. There is something for everyone in Rother Valley. In the spirit of Christmas and giving, will the Prime Minister assure me that families and friends will be reunited and be able to celebrate this most important, happy, and holy occasion as we usually do? Uh, what, I, what I can say, Mr Speaker, is that the more intensively we together follow the rules, the more we follow the guidance in this uh, tough period leading up to the, uh, the 2nd of December, the bigger the chance uh, collectively uh, we will have of uh, a, 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 as normal a Christmas as possible, Mr Speaker, and get things open in time for Christmas as well. Yeah, yeah.
Let's head up to Ealing North with James Murray. James Murray. Mr Speaker, on Sunday, a constituent emailed me about the track and trace system. Her family had received multiple calls asking for the same information, and there was confusion as the operative admitted they were struggling with London postcodes and local school names. Last week, the former Health Secretary, the Conservative Chair of the Health Select Committee, said that centralised contact tracing is always going to be less effective than a localised model. Will the Prime Minister now admit that the current outsourced model has been a waste of time and taxpayers' money? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, we're looking into the issue of repeat calls, but I think to, to say that the, the test and trace uh, system has been a, a, a waste of time and money, which is, I, I think, what I, I heard him say, I, I couldn't disagree more, Mr Speaker. This has been something that has enabled us to locate where the disease uh, is surging, uh, to take appropriate measures and uh, to allow people uh, in huge numbers to get tested, uh, more people tested in this country than any other country in Europe. I think the PCR tests that uh, NHS Test and Trace have uh, been conducting have been of real value in fighting the disease. And now, Mr Speaker, as you know, we're rolling out the lateral flow, the, the rapid turnaround tests as well. Let's head up to Yorkshire with Julian Sturdy. Julian Sturdy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, with yesterday's positive news on the COVID vaccine and the rollout of mass testing, and as York's virus figures continue to fall well below the level at which we were put into tier two. Can the Prime Minister give York some hope to sustain our great city by clearly outlining the criteria under which we can escape immediately into tier one from the 2nd of December? And will he also urge York Council to take up the government's offer of mass testing? Prime Minister. Uh, yeah, yes, indeed, Mr Speaker. I, I urge uh, York Council and, and councils across the, the, the land to uh, take up this offer of mass lateral flow testing. I think it's uh, a, a very, very exciting uh, possibility. It's one of the, as I say, one of the boxing gloves that we hope to wield to pummel this uh, disease into submission. The other is the prospect of a vaccine, and uh, that is what we will do continuously throughout the weeks and, and months ahead. Uh, but I must stress that the way to get ourselves in the best position to achieve that, Mr Speaker, is to make these current, uh, these current restrictions work so that we can come out well back into the tiers on December the 2nd. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will doubtless recall meeting my constituent, Ronnie Norquay, on board his crab boat Carvela when he visited Stromness in Orkney in July. I know that Mr Norquay told the Prime Minister about the problems caused by the Migration Advisory Committee classing deckhands as unskilled labour. Since his conversation, which must have landed quite well because he was allowed back onto dry land safely, <laughs> the Migration Advisory Committee has changed their advice so that deckhands are now regarded as skilled labour for whom visas can be issued. The Home Secretary, unfortunately, refuses to implement that advice. Will he put this at Home Secretary straight on this one, please? Get it sorted. Prime uh, Minister. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to the Right Honourable Gentleman. It's a, a subject on which I have a, a keen interest because I had a, a wonderful day on that, a wonderful morning on that, on that crab boat. They're fantastic, uh, prodigious quantities of crabs. They were selling to China. Uh, as, I, as I recollect, and uh, I, will do, uh, I will make sure that the, the Home Secretary is immediately seized of the matter and we, and we take it forward. But this is one of the things that we are now able to do, uh, thanks to uh, taking back control, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, of our immigration system, uh, which, uh, alas, his party uh, opposed for so long, and, and his party, Mr Speaker, would reverse if they could. Hail Lord Brian. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I strongly welcome the introduction of the National Security and Investment Bill today. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that when countries trample human rights at home and threaten our allies abroad, they shouldn't expect to be able to buy up strategically important industries in this country with no scrutiny, not least where they refuse the same kind of investments in their own countries? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Mr Speaker. One of the, one of the many uh, merits of the excellent conversation I had yesterday with uh, President-elect uh, Joe Biden uh, was that we were strongly agreed on the need, to, for the, once again, for the United Kingdom and the United States uh, to, to stand together, to stick up for our values around the world, to stick up for human rights, to stick up for global free trade, to stick up for NATO, uh, Mr Speaker, and to work together in the fight against uh, climate change, Mr Speaker. And it was, it was refreshing, uh, I may say, uh, to have that conversation. I look forward to many more. 
Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister spoke for many of us when he took a call yesterday to congratulate President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris on their emphatic win in the US presidential election. So does the Prime Minister now have any advice for his erstwhile best friend, President Trump, whose continuing refusal to accept the result is both embarrassing for him and dangerous for American democracy. Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I had uh, and have a good relationship with the previous President. I, don't, I do not resolve uh, from that. It is the duty of all British Prime Ministers to have a good relationship uh, with the White House. Uh, but I'm, I, I'm delighted uh, to find the many areas uh, in which uh, the, Biden, the incoming Biden-Harris uh, administration uh, is able to make common cause with us. In particular, uh, it was extremely exciting to talk to uh, President-elect Biden about uh, what he wants to do with the COP26 uh, summit uh, next year, Mr Speaker, in which, as you know, the UK is leading the world in driving down carbon emissions and tackling climate change. Chris Clarkson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This Armistice Day, restrictions mean that we can't mark the occasion with services as we normally would. However, in Haywood and Middleton, veterans associations are following the guidance to mark the day in a COVID-safe way. Will my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, join me in praising them, the Royal British Legion and indeed everybody across the United Kingdom who, is do who are doing their best to make sure that we can pay tribute to those who made the ultimate sacrifice? Yes. Prime Minister. Yes, indeed, Mr Speaker. And it was really impressive to see the way the, the Royal British Legion across the country uh, organised COVID secure uh, memorials in, in, the way that, uh, in the way that they did. And uh, as we salute our veterans, I, I, I just want to remind the House that we've launched a new rail card uh, for our veterans and their families entitling uh, their uh, users to substantial reductions in, in rail fares, and we're introducing a national insurance break uh, for employers of veterans, Mr Speaker, in their first year of employment. Let's head up to Langshaw with Kay to Learn. Kay to Learn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Every day there's a new story about dodgy contracts signed by this government. Research by Tussle, the data provider, shows that the government takes an average of two and a half months to publish COVID-related contracts exceeding the legal limit of 30 days. Will the Prime Minister commit to publishing all contracts within the legal limit? And does he accept that failure to address this scandal mires his government's awarding of public contracts? Prime Minister. Yeah. Mr Speaker, of course we publish uh, all contracts, and, and quite right. But I would just respectfully remind uh, the Honourable Ladies, I reminded uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman uh, earlier on, uh, it is absolutely necessary in a massive global pandemic to work with the private sector, not to scorn them or, or despise them, but to understand that it is they who make a PPE, it's they who make the tests, and indeed, as I, as I said, it is thanks to the researches of giant conglomerates, uh, Mr Speaker, giant conglomerates, which they would break up if they could, uh, that we have the possibility of a vaccine. Andrew Salute. On Armistice Day, as we remember those who gave their lives for our country and those who still serve, will the Prime Minister give a positive response to the Living in Our Shoes report to make life better for armed forces families? These wonderful people put up with more separation, moving of family homes and worry about the safety of their loved ones than anyone else and looking after them should be a national priority. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, our armed services simply could not function without the support of their, of their families, and uh, I thank him for uh, what he's doing also to, to raise this issue and for the comprehensive uh, piece of research that he, uh, that he refers to. And uh, we are making good progress, Mr Speaker, in increasing uh, childcare provision for armed services uh, families and also uh, support for employment of partners of members of the armed services. In order to allow the safe exit of honourable members participating in this item of business and the safe arrival of those participating in the next, I am suspending the House for three minutes. Order.